and the contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disposed, or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. The Council acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional territory of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, and we pay respect to their elders past and present. We recognize their heritage, beliefs, and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today, and we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present. I have an apology from Councillor Sims. An apology from Councillor Kira. Thank you. Um, and other than that, we appear to be at full compliment. I think. Um, as you would have been or would realise, uh, three one has been uh, pulled by uh, the third party, um, and with that, we'll go straight to uh, four four one, which is the citywide business model. We just passed to the CEO. Thanks, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Tonight, you can see in front of you is quite a detailed report, and it does detail the creation of the Adelaide Economic Development Agency, which is a Section 42 subsidiary of Council. That's the intent. Um, some of you would know that this has been a long time progressing, and in fact, I remember with the previous strategic plan, it was a, a key um, action within that plan, and, and also with our current strategic plan to see the creation of a citywide business model. So this is pro progressing on, which has been the strategy from two, count, two council strategic plans. Um, and I know that the uh, doing a, a fair bit of work over the last 18 months to really to, to move this forward. And there's been a high level of engagement and a high level of consultations been undertaken most recently. Um, you recall back in August, your feedback was sought at the committee uh, where we workshopped um, the purpose and the powers and the functions and the board of management um, and the funding arrangements for uh, section 42 subsidiary so you recall that session which i thought was really productive um, and um, you know since then we've been really having a, a close look at um, how we can increase economic outcomes and, and obtain administrative efficiencies as well so um, just need to be really clear that the intent is for Council to maintain responsibility and for the subsidiary to focus on delivery. Um, so that's the different differentiation between the two bodies. Um, tonight's focus is really about the charter, which is largely based on the uh, Rundle Management Authority charter. Um, Michelle has written the report and Michelle's here tonight. Um, and I'm going to hand over to her to just give you a very high level and commentary particularly about the recommendations not going to go through the report but the recommendations and then we can just respond to any questions that you might have so michelle if you could just do that thank you mark through the chair um yes so um as uh, mark has indicated um, i'm just going to talk through oh, the report really talks through um uh, the proposed amendments uh, the RMA Charter um, and then really the next step. So in drafting those amendments to the RMA Charter, um, I really endeavoured to incorporate um, two, two key things really. So elected member speaker at meeting on the 18th of August um, and then also feedback from the roundtable consultation process. Um, and subsequent to that, um, we had a couple of meetings um, and discussions with um, representatives from the Adelaide Business Collective and uh, Rumble Mall and East End Precincts, um, as I understand, and then we had, had some feedback from them in, in advance of the August meeting. So just to really understand where they were coming from. Um, since we've also engaged with the Office of Local Government um, and the Attorney General's Department to really discuss that approach of would we amend the um, existing Rundle Mall Management Authority Charter um, or would we establish a, a new charter that incorporates the functions, et cetera, of the RMMA and um, lines up the RMMA. So we've gone through that process. Um, and we've also um, sought advice in relation to the processes under the Local Government Act to um, ensure that we get the process right, but also the timing of the commencement of the amended statutory right as well. Um, and, and so in that, that really helped us develop those recommendations that you see in the report before you. So that's why I'm going to specifically talk through the 
recommendations. So they are a little bit legalese, but there's a reason for that. So really, if you look at recommendations one and two, um, in sort of plain English, they um, involve amending the Rundamore Authority Chart, but not that the intent for this is for it to occur on the date that it's published in the Government Gazette. So this is a procedural measure, because if you just make a decision right now to amend it, well, not today, but next week to amend it, then it would come into operation as soon as we gazetted it. So we've got a really clear distinction then um, in this recommendation that we're asking you to uh, delegate that date to the CEO. Um, and the intent for that is to ensure that we've had that opportunity to um, understand what the amended charter says and then have sufficient time to reflect that in terms of the implementation and the commencement of operations. So that's really what um, recommendation one and two deal with. And so if you could imagine, we have some recommendations in there um, in terms of clauses relating to the board of management, for example. So um, at the moment, I think um, we have relevant experience of commercial acumen to all it says about the Board of Management for Rundamore Management Authority. What we heard from our community um, is that we want a skills-based um, board with a range of knowledge and experience across a wide variety of areas. So if you um, immediately um, change the charter, it doesn't give us a process to really think about how that then, how we would enact that process in terms of expression of interest, um, what we need to do with um, talking to the existing board. So that's why that time frame is important. So recommendations four and five really um, talk to that um, in that basically um, we're asking you to provide um, uh, delegated authority or the power under the Act for the CEO to actually um, uh, remove members from the board. Does it mean that all members would be removed from the board? Um, but being able to actually look at the skills against the skills that we're asking for in the amendment charter and then go through a process where there'd be an expression of interest where existing members would be able to apply for that but we would then bring those recommendations back into council council's decision as to who ought to be appointed to the board and it's that timing that's really important to enable that to happen um, the um, importantly to note you'll see that that recommendation is worded in such a way that the CEO is only given authority to the RMA and this amendment process, so we can't make decisions about ACMA or, or other things or post this experience of uh, this, this um, transition as well. Um, recommendations uh, in eight and nine, um, and I'm not really think I need to talk about um, five and uh, I talk about, um, six and, and seven because they're really just noting really pretty self-explanatory. But recommendations eight and nine uh, are basically seeking council's approval to redirect um, existing funding. And of course, this is unspent funding um, from this financial year um, that have already been endorsed by council in the 2021 um, integrated business plan and budget. Um, and there's no proposal to seek additional funding you know, this financial year. Uh, we're also in those recommendations, also trying to make it really explicit um, that we're not proposing to make any changes to the Rundamore separate rate. Um, we would continue to um, use that rate uh, in accordance with Council's endorsed um, 2021 Rundamore business plan and budget to deliver the existing activities that um, council and board had agreed to. So things like the roadmap to recovery, the campaign that's currently out there, um, uh, Black Friday, Boxing Day and Christmas, um, events and activations, etc. Um, and then um, recommendation 10, uh, which notes that funding for future years will form part of the um, Council's annual integrated business plan and budget process. Um, it's really making it, you know, it clear that um, the, as, as, the, as what happens with the RMMA currently, um, the business plan and budget for the amended subsidiary would go through a normal uh, process where it would go to the board and back 
talking to council uh, for council's consideration and endorsement as required currently under, under the Act, so that wouldn't change. I think what's probably really um, uh, a good example of that would be um, if you think about festival and events funding or our strategic partnerships funding, what we're intending through that process would be that um, you know, the, the authority would make recommendations to the board in relation to what ought to be funded uh, and then the board having um, taken into uh, account all of the board's you know, broader considerations as well and their expertise and so just the City of Adelaide staff would then make recommendations around that funding to council. The council would still have um, the final say in terms of the expenditure of those significant sponsorships and strategic partnerships. That, that's really um, the key elements of the recommendations. Um, the one other thing I just wanted to draw to your attention, because I think it is really important in terms of what we heard from our precincts and also our city businesses through the roundtable process, um, was there needs to be this formal mechanism for them to raise matters of strategic importance mm -hmm. um, on a regular basis and its flow of information backwards and forwards. Um, so the board understand what's happening at the grassroots level and also the board can feed back um, to um, city businesses, market research and intelligence. So one of the key things um, in the report is um, that we do a co-design process um, with businesses and precincts so that they're actually informed this um, cons consultative um, process looks like um, and that that would then feed into um, Possibly because what we heard was there's some interest from some people around the precinct boundaries. So possibly around um, would you change them or actually are they really working well and we're happy with them, those that spatial extent of the existing precincts. But then really um, very importantly, which will need to happen, is what that governance relationship with the subsidiary would look like. So there's a clause in the charter that actually enables that um, to be created. So I think that's probably provides um, my sort of things that I think Council might um, be interested in, but um, over to you for questions. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Councillor Moran? Uh, yes, two questions. Um, if we're going to a skills-based um, criteria, what on earth have we been doing since we, uh, what criteria did we have before that? Just pick it out there. Um, through through the chair. So at the moment, um, it's uh, relevant experience and commercial acumen. So it's very open. Whereas what we heard from um, the community, our businesses and our precincts, is they want a very specific skill set um, and across a range of those um, specific um, areas. So things like economic development, uh, retail experience, business economy, etc. But didn't we have all that before? No. Oh, Franz, speak up now. You're getting get rid of you. Um, also, why... Oh, 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 oh. No, this is obviously to roll the quiz and board. And why is um, CEO delegated authority to do to be the hitman? Why, who has it now? To we're, we're, not, we're not going to use the language hitman. I take umbrage with the use of roll the board. That's not what we're doing here, Councillor. That's um, why not, well, is well, 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 I'm and sorry, Anne, 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 you're, you're, you're misunderstanding, your misunderstanding of the content in front of you, okay, is, 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 is very telling right now. So if we could, if you could at least refrain from using inappropriate language or reflecting upon other members of the committee in a very poor light. I'm not reflecting on anybody in the committee. I'm asking you, when we set up the uh, run the model that Greg and I were there, of course we were going to pick skill-based people. It is a nonsense that we haven't had skill-based people and now we're having specifically skill-based people. You seem to be answering your own question, Councillor Moran, because you asked well, in the first instance, what were we doing? I'm not even talking to you. I'm trying to speak to someone. Well, you are talking to me because all your remarks come through the chair. Okay, can you please get to the crux of your question? This isn't good. just running commentary. Do you have a question? And I think they're asked and answered. No, Michelle? No. I think if you could restate the questions in a concise manner. Is, 
what actually specifically is different when you call it skills based that has happened before? Seems to me, and this is the worry that I have with it, that you're putting criteria, which is really the same criteria, to get rid of certain board members. What is the difference in skill base and experience in various business models? Right. What is the difference? I haven't sat here for 25 years and listened to this bureau speak without knowing exactly what's behind it. So Michelle, and if you could also please address whether the intent of the draft charter is to clear out current board members and if any board members were in mind when the charter was drafted, I'd be very appreciative. Um, so through the chair, um, so it's, it's actually a, a, a really good question. Um, so it's something that we've really considered in detail and we've actually sought advice around this. Um, and what's really important and the way that we've crafted those recommendations is we're not actually presuming that the current board does or does not have that range of expertise. But what we, what we would want to do is um, provide the CEO with the power to, um, words, the power to remove um, a board member um, from the office because council would need to delegate that to um, the CEO. Um, and then we would actually look at what are the range of skills and experiences that would, it, on the presumption that council approves this, these draft amendments. So it's very clear in terms of um, economic development, brand marketing, public relations, etc., through to financial management. We, we, we ran on that criteria. That leads to my next question. Why is the CEO been given the delegate? I presume it's we've got the authority now. Why, why, why should the CEO have it? What, what, what is a, a delegation is a really important thing and you just don't do it with any information. I want to know why you can't trust the council and why he's been given the delegation. I don't mind the video. I could care less who's on the board or not. I mean, I'm sure they're all decent people now and would fit the criteria. This is a very funny thing. You know, the word around the street is that this board, because it's like, you know, you apply for your job, and it's easy to apply for your job again. And I'd be very surprised in 12 months' time if anybody that's on board will be on there now. In my experience, when you change the, the word from to skill base, it is a, a different, pretending to be a different criteria. Of course we pick them for skill base. But the question I really want to know is why, what is the reason for such an important thing to be delegated to the CEO? Um, so through the chair, so um, part of the way that we frame this is to do this in a timely fashion to try and hit those deadlines in terms of early in January. So if we look to bring in um, that process in terms of we, we go out and we engage with the existing board, um, we look at the, you know, the assessment in terms of what skills are on that board and whether they um, provide a range of skills right, which they may well do. Um, provide a range of skills across all of the. Um, yes, yeah, because I know. Why, why can't we call a special meeting? Is it because we only meet once a month now that we're so not that we can't <coughs> have information? Why, why can't we call a special meeting? What I'm very unhappy about delegations. Through, through the chair. Because I think it's open to political interference, and I think it should come to council. Through the chair. To be clear, there is no reason you can't call a special meeting if that's the desire of council. Happy to to enable that, but I think. To to do that. We're trying to achieve this rollout in a timely manner as best we can. Remind you that the appointment of board members is ratified by council. So it's not something... You're not busy, CEO. So what is the reason? I still haven't heard a reason. Well, Councillor Moran, I won't allow you to speak for me when you say we're not busy. And furthermore, I want you to withdraw the accusation that the CEO would be politically influenced by councillors outside of a council meeting. You suggested and you remarked that our CEO interference if he were delegated the authority to remove those board members. That is an incredibly serious accusation. You are accusing me of breach of the Local Government Act and I'd ask you to withdraw. That is, an extreme extreme that is very inappropriate, Councillor Moran. I would ask you please to withdraw that remark. Councillor Moran, Councillor Moran, could you uh, please I, just withdraw the remark? No, uh, the so the remark stands? Could I explain my remark? Thank you. This is the democratic chamber. This is where decisions are made democratically. Given to the CEO, that is the democratic process. If you're scared
in part, it becomes a non-democratic process. I'm not accusing the CEO of anything. He need us in the staff to instruct. It's not his job to make these decisions. It's our job. Councillor, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to rein you in here because we're here to interrogate the matter. We're not here to debate it. If you don't like recommendation uh, four, then you can debate it. You can vote against it. Then you can put amendments. Then um, I, I've 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 already allowed I've already allowed enough discussion on this point now, and I actually think it's doing a disservice to the rest of this report, which is not about who gets what going on the board. And my reading of it, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, is that if people were removed, they are welcome to reapply to, to a bit. Right, exactly, that's correct. Um, to, to be on the board of the amended subsidiary. Uh, I think we've spent enough time on, on four. Four is not the substantive matter before us. What is before us is actually this amended subsidiary and how it's going to deliver for our businesses. So I'll open the floor up for questions on the substantive matter, which I think is the more important matter. Members. Councillor, uh, sorry, Lord Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Um, there is no, the charter is silent in terms of the number of terms. Um, so can you just um, talk to me about uh, the intention around uh, numbers of the number of terms that a board member can? Uh, uh, yes, so through the chair, um, correct it is on the number of terms and, um, and the intention of that was, well, it was because uh, any appointment needs to come um, in the year. Um, so we didn't necessarily see a requirement to limit the term um, of any appointment because um, council would always make that decision. So we would have a, uh, you know, maybe a two or a three year term at any time, um, and then you'd need to go back through a process. But if um, elected members are interested in putting a, you know, a, a number of, you know, limit on a number of consecutive terms, that's certainly something we could write into the okay. um, So there's a few things um, uh, which, not necessarily in order, but it, at 18.7, it talks about, which is reflected in the Charter at 8.17, um, which is the ability to raise funds over and above those stages. And it says through sponsorship, advertising fees and charges, it's silent. Um, as a subsidiary, it may be able to apply for grants, particularly in the area of tourism and visitor economy. Um, through the chair, that's that's merely an oversight. Okay. So, that's something so that um, there's a few things, members, which I was going to try and kind of put forward as some amendments um, next week, but I just wanted to talk through them. Um, in 30, oh, I'm not going necessarily in order, but in um, uh, in the recommendation nine, it notes that funding from from the Runwall will be used to deliver the Runwall business plan and budget. And in the paper at 45.2, it says funding need to be dedicated specifically for the management and marketing of Runwall precinct. So should I assume that after 2021, the funding through the separate rate will continue to be used specifically for the marketing and management? Um, yes, through the chair, there's a requirement um under the local government act, if you're a lever, if you are levying um, a separate rate for a specific purpose, which is what the run more separate rate is, <coughs> it needs to be spent on that purpose. So, um, in the future, of course, the council wanted a different type of rate approach. That was a whole of city. That's something the council can consider. So, perhaps for clarity and to make sure that when the um, recommendation is goes through council. Um, we can make some amendments there around just that clarity, uh, noting that that won't be used in that way. Um, oh, you all right, Helen? Um, uh, going back to how we work uh, with our um, precinct groups, um, and other associations. Um, at 30.2, it talks about the ability for the establishment of an advisory committee. And at 31, um, it talks about 
but that is within point two provides us a formal mechanism. Um, again, I think that might be something that we want to pull out and put in the recommendation, just noting that that is the mechanism through which that uh, precinct associations and um, other groups, um, such as the business collective, etc. Um, um, uh, the other one was just really around clarity. I think you provide a bit of that. When we talked about funding at 34 and 35, I was interested in both the clarity around the detail of what is currently in the budget that makes that 5.2 million, and also the process through which council maintains the um, decision making around festival and event funding strategic partnerships. So I think you answered most of that, but is there a way that you could provide us some um, some detail around what's included or what's not? Um, firstly, through um, the chair, um, we could perhaps do that by um, a direct email. Um, so I went through the budget and I was working through the budget as to what in my head was included and not, but I just wasn't at sure as to what's in point two million and what's not. That's so, a question too. So yes. I think that if if um, Michelle needs to provide us yeah. with that just so that we, we understand that breaks down to um, yeah. what's in and what's not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the same thing in 35, which is the 2.7. Um, just interested in what the split is between what goes what goes with the agency in terms of operating and what stays with around, particularly around the marketing function, yeah. um, would be great. Would you be able to do that for us? Um, yes, through the chat, absolutely, I can do that. Excellent. Um, the other one, which was just a, a, a thing that I pulled out, which was 20, I think um, looking at the ongoing funding options, we can discuss that in council, but um, um, the one around the levy, uh, at 46, it talked about how that funds moves over. Um, however, that will be six months through the financial year, so it won't be 7.9 million. It will be funds that are unexpended at that point in time. So, yes, through the chair, yeah, that's a very good pick. That's exactly what that would be. Um, I think that was it. so. It was charter terms, clarity around detail of information. Um, probably a, a couple more parts to the recommendation that really calls out those notes around how the run mall is spent, how we are going to work with our precinct groups as part of the recommendation um, um, that I will um, forward as amendments next week. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Members? Great. <clears throat> um, thanks, Chair. Um, Thank you, Lord Mayor, for raising a couple of items that uh, were on my on my list to ask as well. Um, what's in a name? Quite often, a whole a whole lot. So I'm just interested in the rationale behind moving from the authority terminology to agency terminology. And I'm not saying that I have a fixed view about this, but we have a. LA Central Market Authority, we, we currently have a run the mall management authority, and now we're turning it into a different word. And I'd like to understand if that implies something uh, other than fashion. <laughs> fashion, um, very the chair, I've certainly never been called fashionable. Um, but um, I think in terms of the agency authority, um, it, it, it really, I, I personally don't have a preference. It perhaps provides a distinction between we talk about authority or the agency when you're talking about ACMA or, um, or this. Um, in terms of its name, uh, look, we've come up with that because what we heard um, from the um, consultation process was make it really, you know, the purpose really short and simple. It's basically to drive economic outcomes. So we thought, well, the name should reflect that. But you know that I mean that's really a, a decision of the council. But I think sometimes if you put something forward, it, it generates debate. Versus if you're silent on it, it can take a long time to get to anything. Thank you, Matt. 
just a, a, another question through you, Chair. The um, use of the term Adelaide has a, a very, is, is subject to different interpretation for different people and different purposes. Um, I'm just also interested in where we're talking about Adelaide City, of course, and North Adelaide, uh, as just greater Adelaide. Does the the the, uh, the adoption of the term uh, as as proposed uh, create less geographical clarity than it might? Again, I'm not I'm not fixed on this, but we have one opportunity to brand the the, the uh, evolving entity, and it would be good to know that you've given those sort of minor minor uh, stylistic things some consideration. Do you have anything in mind, Greg? You know, uh, out of curiosity. Well, um, uh, always looking at, at how things get abbreviated. You know, we've got, ACA, we've got well, we don't have Ramana. Mm. <laughs> uh, um, you know, Adelaide City Economic Development Agency slash Authority. Uh, um, that that mm. would be my only particular thought, but subject, you know, open to others, or indeed to um, reject it. But, um, okay, <laughs> yeah. uh, understood. Was there anything that needed responding to Michelle or Claire? Um, I feel um, just give a comment, Councillor Mackey. Um, over many years, what we've heard from particularly um, the business community is sometimes the term Adelaide City sounds or feels like there's a ge geographical border. Um, and what, um, what we've heard recently is that, particularly through um, the brand work, was that by having um, Adelaide as the sort of central plank, uh, the city is for Adelaide, um, not just a regional or a bounded area constructed of borders. Does that, does that help? Yeah, no, no, it does. And, and again, through you, Chair, um, I'm being slightly whimsical here, but uh, if we forgot the word authority, which in the colloquial, you know, that can that can easily be dropped. Um, if it were at Adelaide City Economic Development, we'd be ace. Yeah. Yay. Fair point. Councillor Martin. Yeah, just a couple of quick uh, questions. Um, in relation to the funding, um, I'm wondering, given that the administration has said that this, uh, this agency will have as its funding percentage of rates, what they expect that to be? Um, through the chair, um, obviously it's part of the um, integrated business plan and budget Process. But if we just look at those numbers that are in here at the moment, you are talking in the order of um, around seven and a half eight um, percent. So, or yeah, so we're thinking around that order. If you, so, in terms of um, of the rates, I should say, not of the whole entire um, yep. revenue. Eight percent of that is um, is businesses. So it would be, um, I think our budget's just uh, um, 100 million, so. Okay. And look, uh, I'm interested in staffing um, at 29, especially. Uh, I'm just puzzled about how this works because uh, we talk about having only uh, one person looking after this, working to the board, a managing director, and staff who can be co-opted. Are they going to be pulled from the organisation at will, or will they be assigned to the agency? Um, through, through the chair, um, so all of our um, subsidiaries are actually employees of the City of Adelaide, sure. they're not employees of the subsidiaries. So in the same way, the, um, the amended subsidiary would be employing City of Adelaide um, staff. I would suspect a number of those roles, many of those roles, um, are very aligned to what people are currently doing or the skills get that people have. But we go through the normal process, through internally, um, in terms of any amendments or, or, or changes. Currently, anything that uh, perhaps might be a change is obviously um, we look at our own internal staff. 
first to fill those positions? It's an uh, ongoing basis because 29.1 talks about seconding people. So we're not talking about reaching into the organisation, tucking individuals out of will. That is, they will go through a selection process and form part of the staff. Yes, Thank that's you. correct. Uh, Chair, may I make a couple of comments? Look, I, I, uh, I share Councillor Moran's concerns specifically and generally about delegating so much of this to the CEO. Um, it seems to me that there's much uh, that this um, should be making decisions about. But I, I am disturbed in some discussion that follows this. The last time this came to Council was as a proposal to grant consultation. And we've had the consultation and what's been presented to us is a set of recommendations. So uh, you know, all the ingredients have been mixed and the cake has been baked and it's been presented to us here as a set of recommendations. And then I hear people around the room putting the icing on the cake, you know, arranging where the sprinkles are going to go. Um, and yet this has morphed. This has morphed into a very large cake that wasn't present when we last discussed it. This is now actually talking about not a citywide business model that deals with the promotion of businesses and retail activity. It is now an economic development agency which is going to take some of the responsibility the elected body has in areas like tourism and also we've heard tonight about funding for um, uh, festivals and the like as recommendations come to this council. So this, this whole layer of bureaucracy has been determined without any consultation with us about the consultation. The baked cake is on the table. Now, I have a problem with that. I have a serious problem about it. I, I don't have a problem with an economic development agency. I think that's, you know, that's noble uh, and I wouldn't deny anyone uh, as Lord Mayor or Council having a principal economic agency. But in order to achieve that, we are bastardising the Rundle Mall Management Authority, I think out of convenience because that's the vehicle through which we'll do it. And we are somehow expecting this development agency to be this all team, all dancing body, which is not only going to drive investment, which is not only going to to drive economic activity and tourism and festivals, but it's also going to choose the Christmas decoration for Rundle Mall. And it doesn't take too much to work out that a body that's going to be more concerned about these high uh, outcomes is going to be much less concerned about the retail activity in Rundle Mall and, and indeed in the precinct groups, um, which, which really uh, barely rate a mention in here. Um, this, uh, this board of people with specialist skills who we learn in here are going to be able to teleconference will include only one person who must have business and in the city, only one. And no, it can have more, but that's the minimum requirement, one business person. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, uh, no, um, and and, 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 and I just continue? No, you can't actually. Um, no, this is committee. There is no timing on. No, no, no. There's no time limit as to the number of times you can speak. Uh, there is time limit on what you can say in any one point in oh, the committee. Oh, wait, 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 um, come back uh, and I, I did give you a bit of the way there because you are debating the content of it. I know. I know that you tread a fine line, and it's hard for you to it's in your name. No, so no, no chair, chair, chair. Please but, don't. But you are de no, you are debating the content. You are the content of the report. That's not what we're here for. That's what the council chamber's for. We'll no, be there I next week. That. We'll be there next week. I understand that. I just hold I am coming to the bit that I think is really important, which I want to persuade my colleagues to consider. The persuade. That's what you do. Persuade. Oh. Debate. We'd make you debate it. Save it for the council chamber because we're not making a decision here tonight. All right. Well, then just or send us an email. Even better. This meeting, this meeting, this meeting, this meeting is to interrogate the matter, but not to uh, suggest meritorious or not meritorious. No, you need uh, to discuss the. And now, and now you're debating the purpose of committee. 
And just and just on that, I just need to correct you on a couple of points. You were on a roll, so I let you go. Um, it was uh, it was actually if you, Councillor Moran, I I am the chair, and I you're not for long, are you? Um, Councillor Martin, I would remind you that when this was only presented to us in a workshop, into it was the late Economic Development Agency that was in the workshop report. So that is not that's not a foreign concept. It's not new. Um, uh, and I'd also just remind you that the when the agenda item is called citywide, when business model. that's the name of the agenda item. But if, if you looked at the proposal for an Adelaide Economic Development Agency, that's what it was called. Um, uh, furthermore, it always actually suggested that the funding body could be made up of sponsorship, the money that goes to the RMM, and all those sorts of funding streams. So that was always incorporated in it, and to supervise, I think, is. Characterization. All right. Let me ask. Let me ask the question, then, Lord Deputy. Please ask the question. If, if that was always considered, why did we not consult on that? We did not ask any questions in relation to this body uh, dealing with sponsorship and the like. We did not. Oh, that's correct, Michelle. Could you? Well, there, there are no questions in here about running festivals and uh, searching for funding. They're not. They're not running festivals. Sponsorship. Well, they're making recommendations. Sponsorship. Well, that's that is actually making recommendations to council on which festivals we support, which is fun uh, festival. None of that was in the public consultation. But this is the point that I'm making, uh, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, that we are being asked as a committee to approve this, missing out completely the step at which we discuss the nature of those findings and how they relate to this. And if I may just say, and this is the only last point that I had, mm -hmm. it, we, we were particularly concerned with the issue of the representation of precinct groups. And to my mind, this has been glossed over. Um, if, this, if this body is to have a marketing role and, and uh, I'm putting it to you, that's going to be overshadowed to some extent by the higher goals, then it must have precinct representation. If it doesn't have precinct representation, then it does not represent the thousands of small businesses in the city. And that's our city. We are made up primarily of small businesses. Now, I am asking the administration, and I look forward to some support from my colleagues, that as amending to include precinct representation. Or waiting for applause. Councillor Cross, or was there anything there that needed? No? Councillor Cross, did you hand up? Um, going to the point that Councillor Martin was just finishing off with, and that's the question that I had is in regards to the precinct groups. I can see that here in point 32 that you have the model there on how um, you want this, how the committee will be structured. Um, so is something this is your advice just I'm not going to try not to go into a debate here but as a question you're advising this is how the model should look like and in council next week we can amend that model is that what is that the procedural here to be clear um, so through the law man in terms the law man through to the chair um, in terms of the process my understanding Jenny is Tonight we um, can talk about it, and next week the um, council will make a decision um, on it, which would be at the moment uh, as the presented the as the presented version presented. that you have here. Well, what, what well, and, and it cannot change between. Oh, sorry. It, it, what you're looking at, it, 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 it cannot change between committee and council. Yeah. You can amend it once it gets there. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. I just uh, on that procedural yeah. matter. Yes. Um, okay. But what um, I have done in terms of the draft charter um, is include um, a new um, part in Rungle Authority's charter that specifically um, uh, enables the establishment of an advisory committee that includes pe people that aren't on the board right. um, for the purpose of inquiring and reporting to the agency on any matter within the agency's functions and powers um, and, it, and specifically put in, put in there to provide a formal mechanism for city businesses, main streets, 
various things to provide advice to the board. Um, so if you look at 32 and that model there, I said that's an indicative model because I wanted to show it sort of visually, but obviously if we went through a co-design process with precincts and city businesses and they said, oh, we actually don't want this, we want something else, or if they did want this, then that advisory committee and its membership and, and um, you know, who's on it um, is really that process that we go through with our city businesses and precincts. So, the clause provides some openness so that we can actually have that process designed with our community because I you know, I don't know what the community wants in relation to that and that's right. what they were seeking. Right. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I skipped you earlier. So I'm used to it. <laughs> Um, so just as uh, one quick question, because uh, you made a comment about policy and delivery. So how you meant that between the, uh, the, uh, the agency and uh, the council, because you, you may mention the council sets the policy and the, the delivery. So, but I mean, for me, I would, I would have thought the agency had to have more control for the start. That's a good question. Um, so the chair. So. So really, um, at the moment, um, we're looking at those types of functions that are currently in economic development around um, visitor growth, um, economic growth, um, so how we support city precincts, for example, streets, um, grants, those festivals, um, and um, event sponsorships, partnerships. So the intention is that those types of outcomes and projects would be within the remit um, of the agency with obviously a decision in terms of the budget and which um, events and, and strategic partnerships are funded and the amount they're funded to coming to for a decision. Um, in terms of economic policy, we're really looking at um, and that remaining with the administration. So that's um, when we're responding and say, for example, at the moment through committee and we're looking at um, how we work with other capital cities around development and leveraging outcomes with state and federal government. So that, that's the type of policy that would remain with the city um, administration versus the agency. What we've heard is that the agency, um, that our businesses and precincts want that to be very action oriented. Like what are you doing out there making a difference on the ground? So that's really where that separation comes, comes in. Thank you. Now, just as my, my uh, observations, one, the, the diversity from the board, I, I just question whether a seven is sufficient, uh, simply because we're not just talking about, you know, like an hour and way, etc. A relatively narrow, uh, um, you know, view because it's mainly a marketing authority. Here we are talking about an organisation that is uh, is going to uh, attempt to uh, have expertise across not just the actual, you know, that component, the universities and all the other uh, uh, visitor economies and things like that. That's a very diverse sort of, um, you know, skill set. And if you were to represent them well, I think, and I mean, unless you've got that seven, uh, it's cool. Thought was um, when I looked at now and the, that's experience of the RMMA, and that is that we are it, uh, for the board. And if we think about it, it's it's not a typical board and organisation relationship simply because the the, the the bit of the um, it's delivering things on behalf of the stakeholders underneath and uh, the, an improved communication between the board, whether that be they have stakeholders to whom they, they uh, talk with. So your, your conversation around, uh, you know, here is all the different stakeholders, bringing them under, you know, into the conversation. It, uh, uh, you know, it may be that the board member may be uh, that person that speaks to a particular uh, uh, in, in the stakeholder group, because that way the results uh, can be better observed. You know, the communication can be more circular. And the, so the administration does its job, but also I think uh, the board will be much better informed because that's, I mean, you want to be quick and nimble is about understanding what goes on. So that they're aligned, or so as I communicating with as, as, as particular stakeholder groups to be talking with them. Um, also, that if we look about uh, around the mall authority, or around the mall was sometimes, but I think as, as, a, a, as a, a full precinct, um, you know, or re representation of economic activity, the central market as, an, as the other pillar of um, an economic activity, it should be also recognised in that. 
It is also a significant driver um, for this patient, and it is it is the opposite. In a, the other uh, major reason why people come to the city on a regular basis, and I think it's important to recognise that in that in that um, context. Um, I mean, I appreciate that financing is something that uh, will have different. Um, no, mechanism of different uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, means by which to, to get them in. Um, and this will be linked in with the strategic plan, I take it. So, but that, so I take it they'll formulate like they do now, they'll formulate their own, it'll come up into ours. Okay. Um, having the RMA separate while you still got separate funding, I can see that's, that's a, a, a responsible thing to do. Um, as I talked about this stakeholder engagement, um, that uh, you know, again, I think you sort of addressed that with regards to the precinct groups and also the other um, stakeholders. So I think you mean because they all need to sort of work together. Is that you have them defined, and then you have uh, their ability to communicate. And um, I think those are the was there a in there front? I'll allow a question. That's cool. It's, it's just covering most of the things that they've that were okay. Thank you. Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, a clarification on a point that was raised. Um, do I understand it that the um, Adelaide Economic Development Authority will not determine precinct funding? Will not? Um, so, so through the chair. Sorry, Franz, if you could thank you. Oh. Yeah. So through, through yeah. the chair. Um, so that will be part of that integrated um, plan and, and budget process in terms of any subsidiary must prepare that um, their board endorse it and it come to council for endorsement as well. So that would be an opportunity to ensure both board and council um, are completely across and endorse what funding is provided to our city businesses and precincts or main streets. So they will become mendicants in a sense. In a sense. The, the precinct groups will become mendicants, as in they will go uh, a mendicant, as someone on bended knee asking for money, cap in hand. That, that's essentially what happens to the precincts. They've got to go to the board or authority and ask for their money. Um, so through... Um, that's the mindset, that's not what happens at the moment. So we would have, I would expect that the consultation process in terms of the advisory committee would really um, speak to what those precinct groups continue to look like as perhaps they are or what else they might be. Um, and that would be a very important role in terms of then how funding supporting precincts and businesses would be um, provided for out of the but agency. The, but the decision will come out of that agency. The, it would go to council. For council via so. that agency? Yes. So, so yes. the agency says, yes, this is a good idea. No, it's not a good idea. The, uh, as in, as in all agencies different. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. That's I get that. Okay. Um, and the uh, the advisory committee, and, and I, I understand and accept what you're saying, that it is not cast in concrete, but what is there that would um, empower those people who are particip participating in the advisory committee to have faith that what they put forward will be accepted? There's nothing in the charter that says the advisory committee's recommendations will be adopted, rejected, whatever. There's just nothing in the charter. Uh, so I would suspect that the the um, the uh, way that would occur is the you know minutes of, of you know of the resolutions that come out of those um, meetings would be very clear whether the board is listening to that advisory committee or not. So the board is meant to be representing you know the economic development of the city. So I would anticipate that the board, as much as those precinct groups, would actually want to have that two-way you know, exchange of information. Mm. So there's nothing explicit in there because that's what the purpose of the board is. Um, yeah, no, I'm getting the idea. Okay, and uh, in addition, as uh, we're talking about 
uh, within the Charter, compensation to pay for travel and the possibility of teleconferencing, are we embracing the possibility that some of the members of the board will come from other states? Um, through the chair, so that's certainly not something that has crossed my mind one way or the other. Um, I think those provisions are probably already there in the RMA. Okay, and can I have an indication given that the decision um, about the vetting of those names will be the CEO? Can I have an indication from the CEO about how he thinks about recruiting board members for this agency from interstate? That's what we're being asked to do, to give you the authority to vet those. Through you, Deputy Royal Mayor, the process would be no different to what the current law is for members of ACMA and RMA. So, Practice. Well, the departure is that in this instance the, the charter now includes teleconferencing. It's already in the charter. It's already in the charter. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Franz. Um, in this conversation, particularly about pricing groups, because obviously it's something that's also dear to my heart. Um, how would we, uh, uh, you know, engage and, and see how we would reconfigure that relationship? So, what mechanism is that? Uh, um, you know, obviously what they do now. So, how are we going to go about um, redefining how it works? Um, so, um, through the chair, uh, what I was, well, if council is um, next week decides that it wants to go with an approach that has a clause in facilitating the creation of that type of and, um, what I would be proposing is to actually commence a co-design process um, with precinct groups um, and city businesses in that transition phase so that you're not waiting for the board to be um, you know started and the, and the amended agency um, uh, you know, establish that you would actually inform that process beforehand. You're talking about the advisory committee? Uh, yes, that, that's correct. So a co-design process, um, which is very much needed from city businesses and precincts rather than from administration. Thank you. Is there any uh, mechanism by which this entity has back into council, noting I presume that they're going to have their own market research and with their expert advice to feed back into council for our policy decisions. Um, so in the, yeah, through the chair, in the same way that we work very closely with Run Management Authority now and we provide um, market and intelligence in terms of say footfall and things like that, that type of relationship would absolutely consider um, continue. So it, it is a subsidiary of the City of Adelaide. So it's a creation of the City of Adelaide in the same way ACMA is. So um, it's very much about continuing those relationships and that information flow backwards and forwards. Through the Chair, I must say though, in the past we haven't had very many touch points. It's been on an annual basis where we receive their annual report or process. My view is that we should be doing it on a quarterly basis um, so that there's much more transparency and awareness of what is being worked upon and deal, dealt with by, by, by ACMA and also potentially this new study. Which is reflective at 35 in the chart. What does 35 say? Uh, 35 reporting um, and yet highlights quarterly, quarterly report to the council. So I'm going to I think though reporting up. is a different step to purposefully, intentionally seeking their wisdom, advice, guidance on our policies given the information that they will be garnering rather than just understanding their efforts and their plan. It's just as we provide football data to them, what are they giving back to us to plan our policy, particularly around all of the areas that they'll be doing additional market research on that we won't be considering. Yeah, so through the chart, absolutely agree that it's really important to have that 
flow information, not just from an advisory group to the board, but from the board also back into um, council and council um, administration as well. Mm. I, th I, think it, I think it is reflected at 35.3, the agency shall submit to council any other information or reports required by council in the time frame determined by council, but that sort of, that, that involves council. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but in practice, is there a less clunky way you can get information? I'm sure you will be information sharing, but. Yeah, so, so through the chair, just in practical terms, and it's, you know, it isn't set out anywhere, um, um, run a more management authority and the general manager and the general manager of portfolios meets um, with those general managers every week um, on a regular basis. Um, and then obviously on an ad hoc basis on, on different um, matters. So that, that type of relationship um, would continue. So, Lord Mayor, then correct. I think um, to that Councillor Donovan's point, it's actually about a free flow of information coming back. So um, there may be something that we can just amend slightly in the chart. That's not, you know, submitting a report on request, but that's what you're talking about, a flow of information so that we gain their insights into what's happening. Yeah. Even incorporation of the purposes and objectives. And and I think it's also, you know, very clear that we all value groups and we're working with them really closely on our um, master planning and main streets. So, so the co-creation and the co-design will be really important, as will that mechanism for them to be able to feed into the advisory, um, however that comes about. I'm also keen that it's not just the precinct groups, that there are other um, stakeholder groups that also need to be part of that advisory and uh, particularly talked about the, um, um, and I've completely forgotten David was groups like Business Collective. So um, because, you know, there are insights though, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, there may be other roles um, there as well. So, um, so it's a matter of how we can um, work with that advisory uh, to inform the board and have, a, again, a free-flowing discussion um, uh, with what they're doing in the precincts. Great. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Chair. Through you uh, to the CE. Um, in your early uh, uh, overview comments, um, Mark, you, you uh, referred to the potential for administrative efficiencies. My question in relation to that relates to, um, given that um, employees of the new agency authority, the, 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 like the, the economic development entity will be industrial e-council uh, City of Adelaide employees. I'm, I'm just interested to understand a little better how we then achieve administrative efficiencies in, in moving to the new model. Not through the chair. It's not appropriate for me to discuss at this open meeting um, staffing matters. Um, but I can tell you that in the very near future, I'll be coming to council with um, a full overview of any changes we are going to be making to the structure and the organisation to achieve efficiencies. This will be a key part of that. So rest assured, I intend within, I think it'll be in the next three to four weeks, provide you with a detailed run through of the entire structure of the organisation. So that's something I'll be doing. It's not really the right time right now, but I can, I can guarantee that it'll be happening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can, I, can I just say to the CEO that if there is to be some restructure of the organisation, whether that be efficiencies or it, it leads to additional positions, then that is properly something that should be in consideration of the process, not something that we're told about later. And I would appreciate some advice in relation to that. I'm happy to have it offline. But I think that's an important part of this process. If there's to be some back end rearrangement um, that informs us so that we can make a truly informed decision. Three, the administration and the executive are still working through uh, the details of our staffing arrangements. So I'm not able to provide you that information right now. 
um, as soon as it is available, as soon as we determine um, the position we're taking, I'll inform you immediately. Members? Um, I just have a, a couple of questions as well. Um, uh, regarding, regarding the precinct groups and, um, and the proposed sort of structure there, um, to what degree, and, and, and given that we're going to have a charter in place and it's gazetted and what have you, for example, the agency um, chooses a model that we disagree with to engage with the precincts, with the precinct groups um, and other businesses as well. What 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 ability do we have to influence influence that? Because I'm I'm assuming we can't direct if we've gone through drafted a charter, it's gone to the minister, it's been gazetted. I'm assuming we can't direct the subsidiary, the section forty two, to do anything outside of you know other powers. Is that gone? We can, but it, it wants so I'm assuming if we direct them to do something, it can't be repugnant to what they're approved by the minister to do. Uh, through the chair, um, of council are um, ruled by uh, Schedule 2 of the Local Government Act. Um, includes a provision that allows the council to at any one time basically override any decision of the subsidiary. So also were to uh, decide that the subsidiary needs to do something else that the board may have decided, mm -hmm. then the council can do it. That's provided for in the legislation. Okay, even if even if the subsidiary might argue that it's it's to how they interpret it. Okay, all right. Well, that's that's reassuring. Um, uh, to um, uh, I would just pick up on what Fran said. I, I, I do think. I, I do worry about the size of it. It's quite, quite. And look, I'm happy for things to be nimble, um, but just the scope and the breadth and, and, and everything that's on that list, um, it it it, uh, it may seem a bit light on with the with the numbers. Um, so through through you, chair, um, I, I had feedback that they wanted a small board, but we also have feedback around seven to nine. So I, I would and and there was feedback. That, it should be an odd number. So, um, you know, I am completely open to what council wants to decide in relation to the numbers of the board. If, you, if council thinks next week that seven is too small, then um, absolutely it's your prerogative to make that decision. Okay, understood. Uh, uh, I've picked up on as well um, the mention of the, sort of the only mention of infrastructure in there is talking about recommending upgrades to Rundle Mall to council or giving advice on that. But I'm, I'm very conscious that there are other highly pedestrianised sections of the city that the agency would, uh, well, the, the the people the agency is there to serve the customers and the businesses with um, could you Could you just talk us through that a bit? Obviously, there's been a lot of investment in Rundle Mall um, and, the, and the management authority, I'm sure, engages quite frequently with you on the state of the infrastructure there. Um, what scope would the agency have to say uh, uh, to recommend other things, whether it's in the east end or the west end? Yeah, uh, through you as chair. Uh, so that clause is a, an existing clause mm. in the Rundle um, Management Authority's charter, mm. um, reflecting obviously the investment by um, the separate rate in the precinct and their particular interest in that precinct. There would be nothing, no reason why. Um, council couldn't suggest an amendment that there was a, a similar type of recommendation, um, uh, you know, ability to make recommendations on other areas yeah. within the city. Yep. Okay. Understood. Um, I think I think those are the main things um, that I wish to cover off. Uh, re just regarding regarding um, engagement, if I can just just back to precincts just quickly. Um, I, I do just think there needs to be a little bit more rigour around it for, for us to feel comfortable um, with how that's going. Um, it concerns me that, it, and in fact, it's <clears throat> it's okay for some time that a uh, precinct has no definition and you get some groups that pop up in the city and say, hey, we're a precinct group. Um, uh, and that's just never 
acknowledge them as a precinct group, um, and yet they argue that they're more representative than other official precinct groups. Um, so I, I just, and, and then that there's no um, uh, rigor or governance rigor around how uh, how it's going to interact with the agency or authority or whatever and their board and, and how that's how that's going to flow and that will come out in a consultation. Um, but I do think we, we at least need some some bare bones around it um, before we go into there. Uh, but that that was all for me. Did that unless any further members or there any other comments? Lord Mayor. Sorry, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, what I might do, uh, members, is I'll just put forward uh, some amendments from what I've heard tonight, if that's all right, and I'll just um, maybe um, circulate that uh, ahead of next week just to see if we've sort of captured any of the concerns and some of the amendments to either the recommendation or the charter, if you're happy with that. Lord Mayor, do you think, um, sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, if anyone has any um, amendments then before council next week, so we have time. So if anyone else has amendments, to all put them in. Yeah, so I just, I mean, obviously we'll be in the chamber, of course. but it's just a matter of, um, so that we are prepared and just make sure, because there's a few very simple ones that um, I can sort of heard in terms of tonight, which I've noted, so we will be debating in the chamber. And, and, and procedurally, I'm just conscious that you can only have two amendments on it. Right on something, um, so people should bear that in mind and uh, I think some degree uh, work together perhaps, Councillor Martin. So is the Lord Mayor foreshadowing that she'll incorporate what I proposed as an amendment? I don't think she's foreshadowing anything in particular because that wouldn't be well, she right. Said she that wouldn't be right, but she's foreshadowed that, that she will suggest some changes. I I'll, I'll leave it up to you to discuss directly with her the nature of those changes. Oh, well, I'll ask her to include uh, the one that I would make, yeah, okay. Okay, does that, um, does that tie us off? Yes, all right. <laughs> all right, thank you. Uh, that being the case, I'll close the meeting at 7.13.